The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's webinar. The title of today's webinar is The Past, Present, and Future of APS Training. And I'll introduce our speakers shortly. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> A quick disclaimer before we get started. The National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System, or NAMERS, and the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors and our speakers' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent those of the federal government. And I think that's the fastest I've ever read that. Um, next slide. A quick note about our APS TARC. If you're relatively new to us, we're here to help APS programs in any way that we possibly can. Just reach out to us. You'll have some contact information displayed at the very end of the webinar where you can check out our website or email us. Um, we work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. These are fancy ways of saying we're here to help you. Um, if you are an APS program, that's why we're here. So just let us know, we'll be happy to do that. Next slide. So please consider joining one of our peer-to-peer -peer calls. We have three of these calls per month. We have one for investigators or workers, one for supervisors, and then one for administrators slash managers. You see the schedule here on your screen. You can check out our website to look at the schedule or email us um, for more information on these, and we'll get you the links each month so that you can sign up for these calls if you'd like to participate. They're very helpful to talk to your peers in other states, bounce ideas off of them, and just kind of hear whatever everyone's doing. They can be very interesting. So think about joining us for one of those. Next slide. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. Today's slides are available to download in the handouts section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Just click on the icon um, and the, the, it looks like a hyperlink and you can download a PDF copy of today's slides. All participants are muted for this webinar, and you can use your computer or phone to access audio. Uh, just adjust the volume on your computer speakers to your desired level. If you have any problems with audio or viewing the presentation, our best suggestion is to actually exit the webinar to close it out completely and then just come right back in. That usually fixes it if it's not a connection speed issue. So if you start to have some issues, I recommend just exiting out completely and then coming right back into the webinar. Next slide. If you have questions of our presenters, simply type them in the questions box at any time. You can also use the raise hand feature and we can unmute your microphone if you'd like to ask a live question. We'll pause for questions at a point in the um, uh, presentation and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. This session is being recorded and will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify via email all of the people who registered today when it's posted online so that you can view it. You'll also receive automatically um, an email about 24 hours, I believe, after the webinar concludes with a certificate of attendance, if you'd like to retain that. Uh, next slide. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Um, with us are three staff from the Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations Program at San Diego State University. Uh, they provide extensive training for the state of California, both at the state and the county levels. And they're also well known nationally for their presentations. We have Kat Preston uh, Wager, the Curriculum Development Specialist. Uh, Emily Sulpizio, a training program coordinator, and Krista Brown, APS Leaders Institute program coordinator. These are all very knowledgeable speakers. I think we're lucky to have um, them on our webinar today, and I will turn the floor over to them. All right, great. Welcome, everyone. We're happy to be here. Um, as Andy said, we're here to present and talk about the past, present, and future of APS training. Um, Krista, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So the unfortunate emergence of the global pandemic, as you all know, brought program and training opportunities as well as many challenges to APS. And with that came additional federal funding to meet critical needs. 
So through our time together, we hope that you all will come away with new training connections and resources to leverage in your state or jurisdiction with these new training funds that are available. So we're going to be discussing various training modalities and examples of how they've been used to deliver APS training both locally and statewide in California, as well as nationally. And we'll also discuss the benefits and challenges of virtual training and the considerations needed for all involved in virtual learning. And then we'll also share training ideas and resources that can be utilized to support APS professionals and programs. So we hope throughout this webinar and we hope um, our time together can be an opportunity for everyone to share training ideas and resources together as a group. Um, so we have designated time throughout our discussion for questions and opportunities for you all to share with us together as well. Um, you can do so in the chat. Um, and we may even have opportunities for folks to unmute perhaps if you'd like to share verbally as well. So let's go ahead to our next slide. All right, so before we begin, we want to first share a bit more about the organization and program that Kat, Krista, and myself are a part of. Um, so the Academy for Professional Excellence is a project of the San Diego State University School of Social Work. And our mission at the Academy is to provide exceptional workforce development and learning experiences for the transformation of individuals, organizations, and communities. Next. So our program, Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations, is one of the many programs a part of the Academy for Professional Excellence. Um, we provide innovative workforce development to APS professionals and their partners. Um, this includes, but isn't limited to, instructor-led training deliveries, curriculum development, leadership development, as well as transfer of learning. So that is a bit about us at the Academy and APS Workforce Innovations. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Kat, who's going to start our discussion together by sharing examples of training modalities that we have used in the past year. Thank you, Emily. Thank you everybody for being here with us and sharing this space. And thank you to APS TARC for letting us provide this um, learning opportunity as well. Remember you're in a moment of learning yourselves. So as Emily mentioned, there will be times that we will have um, opportunities for questions, but we wanted to really start off by talking about like the sky is the limit when it comes to training and how we support staff to be able to do their jobs. And we want us to really expand our vision on what does training look like? What does learning look like? Folks are very familiar with on the job training and folks are very familiar with sitting in a classroom for an all day training and absorbing. But we are going to hopefully share some ideas with you that you can take, access, or even implement on your own. So hopefully by the end of today, you'll have some ideas that go, you know what? We're gonna try that or we're gonna take that. And so when we're talking about training and workforce development and skills to really opportunities to allow your staff to build their skills, we have a huge diverse pool to choose from. APSWI, where we come from, we're really big on doing things in a blended way or multi-modules. So we're gonna share today about a couple of projects where maybe it used to be an all day training but what we've done is started to break things up into mini modules that felt more attainable and really better suited that virtual environment. We're also gonna talk about some blended learning where folks may take like a e-learning first to really build on foundational skills or information, so like that baseline. And then they may need to go into the virtual classroom or in-person classroom and have a skill building day. They might have some pre-work involved, some post-work involved, and even individual practice. We also, within blended learning, have things like booster training. So they might have accomplished one training that, and then a couple of weeks later, they attend like a booster, as well as some transfer of learning. 
We're also going to speak to you about a really amazing opportunity for APS supervisors, which are called our learning circles or support chats. And there's this entire project, which Krista will dive into about the Leaders Institute and how that's evolving and how we've also revisioned the supervisor core. So a lot of folks are very familiar with NAPSA's core competency modules. Um, a lot of folks are not as familiar with the supervisor modules and how um, Krista and our team have re revamped those. There's also, a stepping outside of the box, opportunities for training videos. On our website, which you will see later, there are free, downloadable training videos showing APS investigators in practice. And it's a great way to demonstrate and have discussions with staff. And we're also in the moment of developing some new ones. We also have our e-learnings. Folks are very familiar with e-learning. It's sitting down, taking that e-learning by yourself and getting a certificate at the end. Um, NAPSA core modules, there are those 23, and then there's some other e-learnings as well. Currently, the e-learnings for states outside of California, there's a $50 registration fee. So I do know that a lot of states are using the funding that they're receiving for training to do the e-learnings as well, and then they can follow up with some of the other training opportunities that we're going to talk about. Next slide, Krista. So Krista, Emily, and I are each going to take a piece of a project or projects that we've worked on and kind of share a little bit more about it. After the three of us do that, we're going to pause and hopefully have a discussion and you can ask us questions. So the portion that I'm going to be talking about is really what is this multi-module curriculum? Um, there's a couple of ones that we currently have that I was in charge of, and that was the interviewing alleged perpetrators. It's kind of considered an advanced course um, because it's not a part of the core, and there's some other skills when interviewing alleged perpetrators. We also have a California-specific one called Consistency in Determining Findings. However, states can always adapt to what works for them and their state statutes. So anything we're talking about today, go ahead and use as templates for what you can do within your program. So. When we're talking about this multi-module training, we had to dig deep and go, we had an all-day training with all of the stuff that you're used to, right? Folks are used to driving a training, sitting in class all day, being in their table groups, having the lecture, having those networking opportunities. With the global pandemic, we were all forced to be at home. And in the state of California, that looked a lot different than other states. So we had to kind of shift the status quo. And that was difficult, and we'll talk about challenges and successes. But what we really wanted to get people on board with is you're gonna have to do some pre-work before coming to training, because we don't have those opportunities all day to have those lecture and discussions that we're used to. And with virtual training, it's a lot shorter. The engagement is a lot difficult, a lot more difficult, and participants are really easy to multitask. I will just say there may be a few of us who have done emails, even just being on the webinar right now, and that may not be what we would do in an in-person training. So you're constantly having to combat that. So with all of those things in mind, knowing that learners are just used to showing up, knowing that learners are used to having all of those big discussions in their um, table groups, and then knowing that learners can really easily multitask, we had to break these up a little bit. And what we did was we did some shorter sessions, different content, and really different levels of engagement, because how you engage somebody in the virtual world is a little different than how you engage them in the in-person world. So all of these modules, they create a series. And they all have different levels to them. Some of them, there is individual work. Some of them, there are group work. Some of them, there is some lecture, and but a lot of them, there is discussion. So I wanted you to know that they're available. They're on our website, which Emily will show. And those two topics um, have that multi-module 
training for a virtual room where there is an e-learning, there is that showing up to the virtual classroom for one or two days, going back to practice some of the skills, and then come back to define those skills even further. Next slide, and I will kick it over to Emily to talk about one of her projects. Excellent, thank you, Kat. Um, so another example of workforce development support um, that we provided this year was through virtual, virtual supervisor support chats. And what these are or what they can be referred to or thought of um, are also learning circles. We did kind of interchange that word together, but eventually landed on support chats. Um, so let me explain a bit about what those were and how we facilitated those. So the purpose of each support chat was to bring supervisors together. Um, we did it in Southern California. So we brought soups together from across counties in Southern California. Um, and really the purpose was for them to connect and support each other to discuss challenges, successes, and any best practices that they are experiencing currently in their role as supervisors. So the support chats were designed to allow supervisors to openly share in mutual support, to learn together and process together. And we found this to be really effective and heard from the soups that they appreciated this because often they're providing support and processing with their own staff, but often don't have that time um, or always don't have the same outlet for themselves. I want to talk a little bit about the structure and how we actually facilitated these sessions in case it's something that you may want to implement um, in your state or in your program. So we held four supervisor support chats this year, um, and each of them ranged in length, length, excuse me, from about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, the topics that we chose were based on needs expressed by the supervisors themselves that were inter interested in these support chats and wanted to be a part of them. And while we did not limit the attendance, um, we kind of left it open so folks could come and choose which sessions um, they wanted to be a part of and fit within their schedule or topic really pertain to them. Um, so the number of folks that attended really varied from those four sessions, but we did find that the smaller groups tended to be the most effective and engaging for the supervisors that attended. So prior to each meeting, the supervisors were asked to share what challenges they've been experiencing or what questions they may have for their colleagues based on the topic at hand. Um, so this really allowed for them to first think um, about some of the challenges that they have, where they might want support from their colleagues. So once those challenges and questions were then shared back, they were compiled and shared to the entire group that had RSVP'd for the supervisor support chat. Um, so everybody knew what the questions the group had and where support was needed. Um, and this really allowed for the supervisors attending to prepare ahead of time, get some resources that might be helpful for a colleague um, and share. Um, so they're prepared in the session together. And then with regards to the agenda and the structure of each session, um, we really kept a loose agenda. We did have some, um, a few preset questions um, and some discussion items ahead of time, um, but that really was just to fall back on if needed. We really allowed the conversation and the needs of the group um, to dictate the flow and conversation as needed because it really is their time together and really wanted it to be um, helpful for them. So this is just one example of um, supervisor support that we provided through these virtual support chats. So that's it for my example, but I will pass it now to Krista. All right. Hi, everybody. I've been the silent uh, 
the silent uh, slide driver. I'm really happy to be here with you today and talk to you about a couple things that I've been working on over probably the last couple of years or so. Um, one is a potential model um, that you could implement um, in your state or jurisdiction um, for APS managers and adult service administrators. And then the other um, cat spoke of really briefly is a APS supervisor core competencies. So I'll start with the Leaders Institute. Um, so that is um, part of a three-year ACL state enhancement grant that the California Department of Social Services received and then partnered with um, APSWI, um, NAPSA, um, and uh, UC Berkeley, the um, California um, Social Work Center. Um, so our portion, uh, the Leaders Institute, has what I like to say three legs of a stool. So we have training, we have evaluation, and then we have regional planning and statewide capacity building. And what I'm going to talk to you with you today briefly is the training portion. So um, the overall goal is really to, um, to build the capacity for APS managers and adult service administrators to drive program improvement. Um, we were looking at best practices, research, um, policy, funding, advocacy, everything. Um, the focus is on professional development and capacity building for managers and administrators, and that's something different. Oftentimes, we're, we're, we're very focused on, on workers and frontline staff, which is of absolutely 100% where we should be focused. And then we focus on supervisors. And oftentimes, we forget about the, the um, APS manager and the adult service administrator level um, Y'all have lots of meetings, but do you have a lot of opportunities for, for professional development training and networking? So, um, so we're trying to, to go for a couple different things. So skill and knowledge um, development and also networking and information sharing. Um, it's when we started out, uh, we were fully in person. Um, and we were trucking all along, and on March 5th, we had our last in-person uh, workshop, and we we're like, bye, see you in April, and sure enough, um, we, uh, as we all know, the, the global pandemic um, had different plans for us, and so we paused after March 5th, and we um, regrouped, and um, as of August 2020, we went a full pivot to virtual delivery. Um, so, um, what that allowed us to do is look at our delivery, um, the way that we were delivering, and then re-look at what topics we were thinking we were going to uh, address. So, the pandemic, uh, the additional fundings for um, attention and funding for APS nationally, a lot of stuff going on in California around um, legislation and budget so we were able to it was actually a blessing to be able to pause and regroup and and then move forward so we decided um, we weren't going to hold people online for four hours um, because that's torturous and not effective um, so we decided we were going to do a two-hour workshop plus 70 to five a 75 to 90 minute booster session about two weeks later um, so presentation of material sometimes some skill building and then come back ask questions further skill building information sharing um, that formula turned out to work out really really well um, it increased access and equity across the state um, for those who did not have the resources or the time to travel to an in-person meeting and then stay for an additional training um, this really opened up the, the um, it opened up to the entire state. Um, California is huge. Um, we have very large counties, uh, Los Angeles, and we have very small counties like Alpine and everything in between. And it was so great to be able to see our um, smaller and rural county folks logging in and taking advantage of these, of these workshops. 
Um, I just want to share with you what we did focus on because I think there's applicability to other APS programs. Um, so for administrators, there was an administrator track. Um, for, those, for those folks, we only did a two-hour workshop very hard to to even get them for two hours so they did not have boosters but they had workshops um, and we even started using breakout groups and um, and processing sessions and things like that and that worked out really well so we did topics such as um, environmental scan of the policy and funding landscape we invited Bill uh, Bill Benson and Bob Lancato to give us um, the updates on what was going on with federal legislation and and then we how would that apply to California and what else was going on with California. Uh, for the administrators, we uh, invited our neighbor um, from the north, um, Oregon, came on down and talked about um, their adult foster care system. Um, it's no secret that um, California has a housing affordability and just an overall housing crisis. Um, so um, we are looking at ways where we can um, deal with um, housing affordability, housing insecurity, homelessness, um, and then just to be truthful, safe places where when people do need to be placed by APS, safe placement. Um, so that was a um, that was a, a, a workshop that uh, brought up a lot of discussion and um, the state of California was actually there and was going to bring bring back information to to the Department of, of Social Services. So that was that was pretty exciting. Um, for managers, we focused on um, uh, managing a mobile workforce. So everybody had to pivot on a dime. Everybody, you know, most everybody was remote. Some people still went into the office and and uh, went out in other states, but California was pretty much like it was all remote and um, folks were at a loss to how to supervise and manage their staff. So we, um, that was one of the very first ones we did. Uh, fiscal understanding of funding streams. California has a very complex way of, of funding APS, um, and actually a lot of folks didn't understand it, so that was extremely helpful. And then understanding the legislative and budget um, process, which uh, this this year has been huge. Um, it's complex, um, and folks really um, it really got a lot out of that because APS, um, we just went through a, a, a very exciting legislative and, and budget um, cycle for aging and adult services and APS. Um, so that was really topical. Um, and then data. So California uh, is a, a, a state administered county run APS program, 58 counties. Um, we have a standardized data form that everybody inputs data, but everybody is gathering um, and housing data in different data systems. And um, there's some inconsistencies to, to put it mildly. So um, we had a great conversation about that around consistency and some of the, the work that the counties are doing. Um, so overall, our evaluation um, for for the virtual uh, virtual delivery, the topics that we were choosing um, was extremely high. So uh, we had several different evaluation tools that we used, but the end of day surveys for last fiscal year um, were, I believe, 4.5 for content and 4.7 for presenters. Um, one thing that we've been keeping in the back of our mind for the Leaders Institute is that three years is 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 we have a three year grant and so sustainability has always been in the forefront probably starting in year two. Um, so what we realized is with a virtual delivery, um, the the cost of of holding in person training with you know travel and catering and all of the bells and whistles that go with that, um, we can actually build in virtual delivery. Um, for managers and adult service administrators this this fiscal year, this new fiscal year into our existing APS training funding. So th this the workshops will continue on. So that is pretty exciting. Um, ACL is always happy to see when you can you can build um, sustainability. So I bring this to you um, you all because first of all, number one, don't forget your managers and your administrators. Uh, you all deserve um, you all deserve these opportunities as well. And then also to say that California would be happy to share 
um, this model or template with you. Uh, uh, we have submitted to the NAPSA conference to to go ahead and, and present on um, virtual and in the entire grant and lessons learned. Um, there's a stipend program that, that is also able to move forward as well. So um, if, if uh, crossing our fingers that we are accepted, you can come see us. Um, otherwise, you know, please um, let the, the Turk know and, and Andy can, um, can let us know and, and we can connect. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the APS supervisor core competencies. So um, we all know that supervisors have, um, my opinion, the hardest job in APS, uh, multifaceted and a lot of different demands are placed on them, especially um, if you're in a smaller program where you are doing it all, including training. Um, so back in 2010, 2011, and 2012, NAPSA in California, our intention was to create APS supervisor core competencies after we got the, the worker ones completed. Um, we didn't have the funding nor the bandwidth to see that all the way through. So um, a couple of years ago, um, I was tasked to develop a research report and, um, and this last year or so have really worked with stakeholders to revision what APS supervisors need to be able to do their job. Um, so the revamped, revisioned core competencies are built off of, of research, changes to practice, and also those past instructor modules because there were some really wonderful pieces in there. So what we've done is we've developed um, seven competency areas and each competency area has three to five modules. Um, we're developing for a flexi flexible delivery. So the modules are shorter in length. Um, uh, the shortest is 90, the longest is about four hours. Um, they are being developed for virtual instructor-led um, delivery, but they can also be trained in person. They're, they're flexible like that. Um, they're being created uh, in a blended manner, meaning um, there is, like Kat said, uh, you have to realize when you're doing more things virtual, you can't be holding people for endless hours. Um, so there's pre-work, there's transfer of learning. Um, one of the modules even has an, a 60-minute e-learning and then um, a, a 90 minute Still building, so trying to be as, as flexible as possible, um, knowing what we know about supervisors. So California and Arizona are currently developing the modules for these competencies. Um, we are working, um, so it's California, Arizona, and NAPSA. We're working with a um, supervisor stake, um, supervisor curriculum advisory committee that meets monthly. We're always looking for new folks to join us. Um, and these uh, modules are going through um, NAPS, the NAPSA um, Education Review Committee uh, upon after they're piloted and, and finalized. Um, so here are the seven, seven competencies. Um, so each of these competencies have three to five modules underneath them. Um, Andy, uh, you, if you want to learn more about what is, what is actually developed, um, and if you would be interested in piloting um, or accessing um, these modules, um, we are building out our, our web page and um, we'll, we'll be releasing them on a rolling basis. Um, but some of them are in pilot mode and other states are welcome to um, utilize them and give us feedback. Um, so um, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over uh, to questions because I think that we've provided you with a ton of information. Um, but anyway, so very exciting um, to be able to, to be a part of this, uh, this supervisor support and professional development endeavor. It is, it is, it is happening. Um, so this slide actually, um, it actually is up to date, but there's another tracking document that I have that is a 
it's it's a live document. So if you if you want any other information, um, please please do let us know. So all right. Oh my gosh, that was a lot of info. So questions. Thank you, Krista. And this is Andy. Uh, we did have one question, which I assigned to Emily. Um, I will uh, read this for the group. What size group did you find was ideal for supervisor support chat? Yes, I did see that question come in. Thanks, Andy. Um, that's a really good question. I would say most ideal, as I mentioned, um, the smaller the better is what we found to be most effective and engaging just for folks to be willing to share. Um, to, and to get information out of it. So I would say four to six supervisors is probably the best um, and really varies and depends on topic. Um, I'll share some of the topics, like the first supervisor support chat we did was on COVID-19 challenges and all that came with that. Um, another topic was supporting staff in managing caseloads and reducing worker burnout. We did one on um, personnel management, um, so managing personnel issues and boundaries. Um, and then another one was, as I mentioned, since this was across counties in Southern California, um, we did one on county structures, staffing and teams, because a lot of the counties in Southern California operate quite differently. So it was an opportunity to share. Um, so it does depend on topic, but I definitely would say for a smaller group, four to six folks, um, four to six supervisors is most ideal. Great. And I'm sure that um, when you have smaller counties with, you know, very few people, the opportunity to talk to other supervisors in other areas is very important, I would imagine, um, you know, yeah. when you don't have other supervisors to bounce it off of. So that's great. Um, one just kind of general question, and I'm not sure who would answer this, is what do you, how do you typically provide continuing education units, formal continuing education units for any of these activities? And if so, what's involved in that? Anybody want I can to take discuss? that. Oh, sure. go ahead, Emily. <laughs> um, Chris and Kat, please fill in behind me. Um, but yes, um, for many of our trainings and workshops, um, we do provide continuing education units, um, if applicable, um, to the session. Um, not much is entailed in that on our participant end. It's really up to us to make sure that a course um, is suitable and um, is approved to be a CE. Um, and generally what we do is we just um, ask if anyone would like to receive the CEs and we make sure we get they get credit for that. There's also a survey um, that asks to, to verify um, and we have all of our courses that are approved are um, approved by the accrediting board um, in California. Um, but Kat and Krista, feel free to add. No, I was just going to say, um, like our, a lot of our e-learnings are, our um, in-person or virtual trainings are as well. And as Emily mentioned, with when we ask folks if they are, if they need or want CEs, um, there are some other things that behind that where they have to be there for, they can't miss more than 15 minutes. And so we're trying to navigate that in the virtual world too. How do we know yeah. that you're actually there and that kind of stuff? So. Um, that's something within our team, our training, um, training coordinator, she's able to kind of peek and see if people are there and answering questions and that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that anybody who is <clears throat> considering offering, offering training to their APS staff in their state, you know, work with your, your state um, office that, that provides continuing education, your counselor and social work board or whatever it's called in your state. Right. Sure. Yeah. I was just going to add for, so for things like the Leaders Institute and some of the supervisor core, it's not going to qualify for CEs just, just because of what the boards, you know, there's criteria that the boards are looking for, Sure. but some of it will. Um, and oftentimes when you're offering CEs, there needs to be some sort of quiz or end of day survey or something. So that's something to consider when you're, if you're thinking about kind of building a, a CE program for your training. Yeah. So, but if, if folks have any questions that we have, the Academy has a, a very uh, well-established CE program and, and um, I had the opportunity to revamp a CE program for a national organization one time. So um, I'd oh. be happy to, happy to share info. Sounds like very helpful experience. And one just observation while listening to all of you having to pivot so quickly to a virtual environment when the pandemic hit. Um, it sounds pretty impressive, everything that you did. So congratulations for pulling that off. Congratulations to all of us for pulling <laughs> pulling it off 
the things we had to pivot. I think that applies to, to uh, everyone who's yeah audience and you know, everyone, everyone like this. How much grade or how much more grade do you all have? Right. I, I have a I have a bit more. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, um, that's all the questions we have right now. Just a reminder to our t attendees: if you have questions, if they occur to you, you can type them in the question box at any time. You don't have to wait until we pause for questions, and I'll assign those to our speakers or you know put them out for the the group of our speakers um, at any point. So. I will let you continue on. Okay. So now that you've kind of seen what is out there, what are we currently working on, um, what's available, we also really want to be honest with you of how we got there, because uh, this was not easy by any means. And I really appreciate, Andy, you saying that congratulations to all of us, every single person. We're here and we're still doing an incredible job. And this was a really intense uh, 16 to 18 months, however you, know, you want to look at that. So we're going to share a little bit about how we got here. And again, um, please ask questions. We'll pause for questions if you have. And we love to hear your voices too if you want to take, you know, ask to be taken off mute. But when you're thinking about, I need to do some training, I have this money, I need to support my, you know, our staff, we want to give you some tips and lessons learned and so that you have this a little bit you're ahead of the game um, because. We were not. We had to learn this all a lot by trial and error. Um, with anything we ever have done before the pandemic or not, conversations with stakeholders is super, super important. And I know you know this. But we also had to go outside of our own stakeholder box. And I think that is something that can never be stressed enough is don't just consider who you normally work with. Maybe also ask who is not here that we should be working with. Who, who else do we need to get opinion from? So our stakeholders who we started really talking to first was those who we serve immediately. And those were our Southern California counties. And we said, okay, we have this plan. What do you need though? What are, what are you dealing with? How can we change? And so a lot of those ideas that you heard from us about the multi-module, the supervisor support chats, training videos, those came because there was a need for them. And so talk to our, talk to your stakeholders. We also have um, what's called our, we work with the NAPSA Education Committee. So we go outside of our own Southern California world and we hear nationally, things are very similar. There's a lot of differences, but within training, people have kind of the same needs. So we worked really closely with NAPSA Ed. We have our curriculum advisory committee that works on core and advance. And then as Krista mentioned, there's a supervisor um, curriculum advisory committee as well. So all of these people are giving input saying, yes, no, I like that, can we expand? And then um, the Leaders Institute, the project that Krista was speaking about, they also have an advisory group. So again, providing input. And then within California this past year, there was a training convening and then development of a blueprint to look at how can a California training system work? What is needed? Because as Krista mentioned, uh, we run as a, as a county-based program. So it, once you get folks input, and you hear them, then you can start to develop stuff and that really helps with the what's in it for them because they were a part of it. So you can always plant ideas, but then listen to see what they're coming up with and then you can implement all of those ideas together. Another lesson or, or something that we're looking at is like, how do we demystify? How do we really clear this up, make things simple? And that was not easy because we were all experiencing our own stuff as well. So within internally, there was a ton of on-the-job learning. We just did a lot of research, attended a lot of webinars and trainings ourselves. We looked at what works in a college setting because colleges are very used to virtual learning. How could we transfer that into training and workforce development because um, APS workers are not really used to that. Um, a lot of practice, trial and error, and then we did have to staff up. When you host multiple opportunities for people to experience learning, you have to have more staff to do so. And the virtual learning as well, because we were able to host them at the same time, we needed people to have moderators, et cetera, in addition to who the facilitator was. 
externally as well, as Krista mentioned, that full pivot to the virtual world, we just stopped immediately of the in-person and went, okay, we got to change this up. A lot of trial and error and something that we continuously hear even 16 to 18 months into this is participants, doesn't matter the level, they love breakout rooms. We would do like five minute breakout rooms, seven minute breakout rooms, and they're like, uh, can we be put back in please? That was not long enough. And that's also about that connection, right? Folks need connection. And if we're not doing it in person, we've got to allow it virtually. And that, I think Emily saw a lot of that in that supervisor support chat as well. So some challenges and successes. I've mentioned at the very beginning, this is a new way of learning. And we pushed people. We definitely pushed folks. We pushed ourselves and we pushed folks. Um, and we heard gripes and we heard a lot of um, claps and successes as well. As I mentioned earlier, virtual training is just a different type of engagement. There's various levels of technology comfortability. So some folks, whether it's your facilitator, the trainer, yourself, or your learners, they all vary on what they can use. Some people are really great with Zoom. Some people are really great with Microsoft Teams. Some people have wonderful Wi-Fi. Some people do not. Um, and if you're in a rural area, what does that look like? Or if you're at home and you've got four kids that are also accessing the same Wi-Fi at your same time, all of those challenges. So we had to navigate around that. We allowed for a lot of flexibility and grace, and we were very honest. We said, you know what? We might cut out here. And you know what? We've never done this before. Let's see if we can share our screen. So just really kind of allowing for those moments to happen. Some other, the new way of learning was that blended training that both Krista and I were talking about, um, where again, there might've been some pre-work, attended training, do some of the work on your own, come back to training another day, um, and then maybe even some like post-exam type stuff. Another success and challenge that we were working through was the fact that APS always has a high caseload. I know you all know what I'm talking about, that there's just not enough staff for the cases that are coming in. So you have this high caseload, that's always a challenge that we're always going to face when talking about training, whether that's in-person, virtual, e-learning, it doesn't matter. Coupled with a global pandemic, coupled with social and racial justice, and then an election that really had people talking. So here, we're trying to say, we're going to train you in new ways, and you've got these other things going on. So that was a big challenge. And again, listening, understanding, giving grace, and then just shifting and saying, you know what, that didn't work, let's shift. Um, learners have different priorities, right? They show up to your training and they might have something else going on that we don't know about. Facilitators have different priorities and APS constantly has competing priorities as well. So that is something with this new funding is you want to be able to provide these trainings but there's competing priorities. So hopefully today you'll get some ideas or some templates or even some curricula that you can just pop in and start using. A couple of other of the successes and challenges that we saw was just that traveling was on hold. So here folks were used to getting in their car, attending, having snacks, going to lunch together, and that was it. Well, it was put on hold. Now Krista had also mentioned within what they saw with the Leaders Institute is the virtual training allowed for such greater access. People did not want to travel 45 minutes, an hour, three hours, either by train or car or plane, however they got to there, depending on what it was. So folks were able to do it. Also, folks were able to do it while their kids were at home too, because they couldn't leave their kids because childcare was closed. Um, however, some really do miss networking in the in-person, you know, so that's the thing with all of this stuff. In person, there's going to be pros and cons, and in virtual, there's going to be pros and cons, and blended, there's going to be pros and cons. And then the multitasking that can happen during virtual world, that's really challenging as well. So some of our virtual deliveries, they're pretty fast paced. We're asking people to chat. We're asking people to take themselves off mute. We're asking people to do a breakout group. We're asking people to type a reflection, and it's pretty moving quickly because you're not in that training room to do that. Another thing I would like to share about how we got here is within the Academy for Professional Excellence, which is our larger organization, we came together to look at how do we start 
doing a criteria, should something be virtual or should something be in person or could it really be both? And we're starting to work on a rubric to really look at which modality would best fit this curriculum or this type of training or this type of learning experience. And we're, what we're working on is like a numbering system to try to look at all the different things we have so that when we are starting to move back into whatever this new world for us looks like, we have something to say, you know what, we will keep that virtual. Or you know what, we're going to keep that in person or we're going to do both. Once that's developed, we hope to be able to share that as well. Um, but it's really kind of guiding how we're going to move in the future. We also have contracts and some of our contracts will dictate. Um, but the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because I don't think it's an all or nothing. And I don't think we ever have to always just say, nope, we're going back to in-person, so we're going to do it. Nope, we're going to stay virtual, so, and that's what we're going to do. There can still be this talk of what, what is it best suited for. Um, I'll pause there and I'll ask my uh, colleagues, Krista and Emily, if they have anything that they'd like to add on the how we got here. Um, I, I will just add that um, transparency is great and also um, pretty much after every single thing we do, whether it's a pilot or a Leaders Institute um, workshop, we do some sort of plus delta. So what worked, what didn't work, what would you like to see more of, less of? Um, and, and if we had another booster coming, we'd say, okay, you know, how are you feeling on this and what do we need to work on? And so it allowed us that flexibility to kind of really, you know, revise as, as we go for the Leaders Institute. So that, that was really cool. Uh, what we heard um, loud and clear is, like Kat said, people wanted more time in breakout groups to, um, to really connect and do the activities. No matter what you think when you're developing a curricula, that's like, that makes sense. We'll give them 10 for that, and then we'll debrief this and that. that. In the virtual world, you might as well just double it um, or almost double it. Um, if you think you need 10, you're going to probably need 20. Um, so that's something that we're continuing to learn. And, and as, as, um, as the partners are developing curricula for Supervisor Core, I'm reviewing some and I'm like, not enough time, not enough time. Please, let I'll let you know what I've heard, learned from the pilots. So just wanted to let you know as well as is, is, is being virtual definitely works, but it takes time to get in those rooms and get organized. And maybe somebody is like having trouble popping in, depending on what your what your platform is. Um, so those I just wanted to add that. Yeah, and then I'll also add um, the shift from like going to an in-person all-day training to a virtual multi-module um, style of training. We learned um, kind of halfway through that um, it's helpful to really pause and orient folks to what they're about to embark on and um, what they can expect. Um, so we decided to hold just brief what we called orientation tech check. So we allowed them to come on, tech check ahead of time, make sure um, they're comfortable in the virtual environment. We use Zoom very often. Um, and then not only couple that time with the tech check, but also with just, this is what to expect. There is some pre-work, here is what it is. Often it looks like um, responding to questions or completing a pre-work um, e-learning. Um, and then you're going to come to a training, then you're going to have some individual practice on your own. So just really making sure that they understood so that when the time comes, they weren't as lost because it is, it's a very different way of doing training um, that folks weren't necessarily used to. So we wanted to make sure they understood expectations and were prepared. Yes, and materials are very important. Thank you, Emily. That just reminded me that we had to get, we had to step up our game for, for participant materials as well. So, um, so. And we have time here. Um, if there's any questions about how we got here, some of our challenges or successes, we would love to be able to take some. There's one question about um, breakout rooms. Do you feel like you can do breakout rooms with very large crowds? Not necessarily large breakouts themselves, but if you have 100 people in a training, do you feel like it's possible to do breakout rooms at all? Absolutely. It is. <laughs> we do it 
a lot within our own staff because we have a, a little over 100 staff. Um, it depends on the platform you're using though too. So I'm, I am not familiar with Microsoft Teams, GoToWebinar, I am very comfortable with Zoom and it's super easy within Zoom to assign. It can assign um, people you can just do an automatic man having Zoom do it, okay. or you could go in and do it yourself too. Uh, but you could say, I want 50 groups, or I want three groups, and I want this amount of people, and Zoom will go ahead and do that for you. Um, yeah, I would say if you can if you can do breakout rooms, do them, and they're good for you know role playing too. A lot of so in a typical training, you might have like a role play put it in a breakout group and have an observer and two people doing the role play and then have them switch roles and that kind of stuff too, then come back to the larger group and debrief. Gotcha. Um, one other question, you mentioned you were developing criteria for what's gonna be in-person versus virtual. Is there anything you can share about what you've, um, what you've come up with about what you think can be virtual and what you think can be in-person thus far? Yeah, that's a great question and you're challenging my brain this morning or this afternoon for that as well. Um, a lot of this stuff is really the, the deal breakers, I would say, are, is there kind of movement? Does this training or opportunity learning experience need movement? If there's like a lot of roles where you have to stand up, go retrieve something or put a puzzle together or something like that, that would do a low score for virtual and a high score for in-person. Um, networking and cohort groups are looking pretty difficult to do in the virtual world. So what I mean by that is there might be a series, you know, five trainings for a, a type of cohort and part of that transfer of learning, part of the aha moments are within networking groups. So mm -hmm. when you go to lunch or when you take a break and you go grab a coffee together and you're like, hey, you know, Andy Capehart was, you know, he really said an awesome point. Did you get that too? That's really difficult to do in the virtual world. Right. So that would maybe get a lower score. Yeah, sure. Great. Okay. I think that's all we have for questions right now. Thank you. All righty. Um, so possibilities for your program. Hopefully all along the way we've been talking about possibilities for your programs. Um, but just just some some more more concrete um, things for you. So first of all, this is a this is a great possibility for all of us and all of our programs is that I'm sure many of you know that ACL put out an RFP for a national APS training center. Um, and I think we're going to learn probably fairly soon who will be in charge of that and and uh, running it. And that will be a place where it, it'll be a one place where we can find all the great materials and all the great resources that are out there um, in one one spot. So you don't have to be on this webinar or that committee or some of the, 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 the ways that we telephone. The TARC is awesome about bringing this all together. Thank goodness before the TARC, it, it was really hard. NAPSA is awesome. It, it just, it's hard to just bring it all together. And because APS is also very multidisciplinary, there, there are trainings that um, are applicable to APS that aren't in the necessarily the APS sphere, but they'd be great to to have on your radar. So yay, I uh, can't wait to hear how that's gonna go um, and, and what that's gonna look like and hopefully we can all work together to, to make that a great a great tool. Um, Emily's gonna walk through the APSWI website. It, that's the stuff that you wanna leverage today. I know you all have monies and you have plans for more money and you need to act quickly. Um, will show you where the e-learnings are so you could use an e-learning and then use a transfer of learning guide to do a in in instructor-led skill practice either in a team meeting one-on-one -on -one, or a, an actual in you know virtually um or in the training room if you're if you're back together there's full curricula instructor-led um both uh, in person and virtual um, you can contract um, with a trainer or a consultant. 
Um, we heard through NAPSA Education Committee the other day that a lot of states are using funding to train the trainer. So they're hiring a trainer and then they're having their um, staff development, their soups, their trainers all come in and just get trained up um, on, on things. Um, there are the videos which um, can be used as training or, or enforcing uh, training. Um, and then, of course, there's transfer of learning tools in a field guide. So we'll show you where all of that lives. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer a little bit to my colleagues on this because I'm less familiar with what's going on in Southern California around in-person and virtual simulations and virtual reality. But I know that, that folks other places outside of California, but in California, they're, they're starting to lean into that. So Kat or Emily, did you want to talk a little bit about uh, virtual simulations and, and VR? Yes. So um, a lot of folks within child welfare are probably familiar with a lot of sim trainings. Um, but in Southern California, we have at least two counties who are also do doing simulation trainings with their APS folks. And a lot of it is just how to get in the door. How do you knock on that door and then go ahead and make somebody talk to you or get somebody to talk to you and that kind of stuff as well. Um, so what some folks are doing is they're partnering with our with their county representatives like probation or coroner's office who have rooms and then some a, a trainer usually or staff development officer will develop the learning objectives for that simulation. They have actors, oftentimes they're um, former APS workers who might be retired or other folks who just like to be a part of training and stuff like that. And then their staff are doing simulations. So it's really about, it's, it's taking the role play and putting it, you know, giving it a little shot of espresso and making it really go where folks are able to really practice. So that is a fabulous opportunity. I know a, a lot of our counties are happy to share their um, curricula around those simulations, but if you have rooms available within your own um, organizations, very, very helpful. And you're looking for, you know, did they notice the gun behind the door when they walked in? And did they notice the wine bottles? And how did they talk to them about substance use and certain things like that? So I'm always like, heck yes, this looks fun. So I know I'm a weirdo like that. And then there's also some virtual reality that is very specific to adult protective services or um, health and human, um, excuse me, and home supportive services, where there's a couple of organizations out there that have virtual reality equipment and there's different tracks or different lessons. Um, the equipment is quite expensive. So again, when there's a lot of money involved and you want to have different training ways, this is a way to do it. Um, where folks are doing it, especially for their new staff, how to get them oriented of what you are going to be seeing in the field. This is what it may look like and feel like when you put the goggles on, you experience what something looks like or feels like. You experience maybe some of that early onset of um, neurocognitive disorders because people are, are repeating themselves in certain things like that. So the virtual reality is also an opportunity for folks to get different types of training. Um, that's not the, that typical classroom training. Thanks. Great, thank you. So at this point, I think we're going to go ahead and, and please continue to, to uh, send in your questions, but we're going to go ahead and go, I'm going to um, move us to, all right, here we go. I'm going to move us to the website. <laughs> so here we go. Let me do this. Um, so Chris, Chris is taking us to um, the Adult Protective yes. Services Workforce Innovations website. Yeah. Our program site. And... That work bear with me bear with me okay there we go there it is here it is all right okay excellent so everything that we talked about a majority of um, these training resources are available for you right now as we speak so we definitely wanted to make sure we go through our website so you know exactly where to find them um, so I'm gonna start from top to bottom and you'll see on the left side um, of our website, everything is organized um, by tabs. Um, so the second to top tab is our 
e-learnings tab. And this is where you can find all of our e-learnings that are available. So all of the NAPSA core competencies have an e-learning attached to them. You'll find all of that information here. In addition to the core e-learnings, we also have advanced e-learnings and it is split out. If there are anything like that's California specific, you'll know. Um, so there's advanced e-learnings that are not um, California specific that you and your folks may be interested in, um, as well as a number of e-learning topics on, on financial abuse. So those are really great resources um, that are available and accessible. And then below the e-learning tab, um, two down, we have our APS Leaders Institute. And this is what Krista talked about and shared with us. Um, so if you click on the plus sign that's next to the APS Leaders Institute, you'll find a bunch of information um, regarding training support for the managers and administrators that Krista had shared with us. Krista, anything you wanna add to uh, that page? Um, I will just say that we are in the planning process for our next uh, set of workshops for the, the this fiscal year. So um, what you see here is, is last fiscal year's um, goodies, but will be updated soon. Okay, great. And then moving on, um, on the left side is our APS video. So as you can see right now, we have a number of training videos um, that are available for you all. Um, we actually have two more in addition to these coming um, this year. Um, one of them is on the topic of incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion into the workplace. And then our second video is on interviewing, asking demographics, and asking inclusive questions. Um, so those are more resources. And then moving on under our core competency areas tab, this is where you'll find all of the 23 for California, 22 for um, all other states, the core competencies that comprise the NAPSA certificate program. And as I mentioned, all of these are available via e-learning, um, but many also have an instructor-led version available as well. If you have a trainer or you are a trainer yourself and would like to train these um, in person, if we have the opportunity to do that, <laughs> depending on COVID. Okay, next we'll move on to our advanced training tab. Um, this is where you'll find curriculum and information on those virtual instructor-led multi-module courses that Kat shared. Um, so we have the California Consistency in Findings, which yes, is for California specific, but you can look at that curriculum and see how it was developed with the multi modules. There's also this a very similar version um, regarding to format with interviewing alleged perpetrators. Um, so if you want information on how we design like the pre-work, the actual modules, individual practice, that curriculum is available, trainer manual, participant manual, and additional materials. Next we have our supervisor training. Um, this is all the information that Krista shared about the APS supervisor these are core competencies, and as Krista mentioned, we will be updating and providing um, all of the information for those core competencies as they're available on a rolling basis. Um, and uh, we will provide more information on like our supervisor support chats if anyone's inter interested in those. We haven't designed them for this year just yet, but it will be under that tab. And then two more. Um, tabs that I want to point out. The next one is the transfer of learning tools that are available. Um, there's a number of transfer of learning tools that are available for almost all of the 23. Oops, do we, do we lose Emily? Oh, yeah, but I think we lost audio for you. Emily. Oh, no. oh, are you there? I don't know. Can you hear oh, me? Yeah, now we yes. can. Maybe it's just oh, okay. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so as I was mentioning, the transfer of learning tools, there's a number available for the 23 NAPSA core competencies, but there's also um, a good amount available for the advanced trainings as well. Um, so you can find that under our transfer of learning tab. And then lastly, we didn't talk too much about this, but we also have an APS field guide. Um, this one's really accessible, um, preferably uh, virtual, so online as opposed to printing it out. But this tool that can be used by a supervisor with an APS professional to support new workers in gaining those basic field school uh, field skills excuse me so 
there's um, prompts for activities as well as opportunities for transfer of learning that supervisor and a new APS worker can use as you go through this field guide. So another great resource that's available. And I just wanted to add there that um, Krista mentioned about NAPSA conference. If folks are sending staff or if you're attending the NAPSA conference yourself, um, there's a couple of workshops that we're waiting to hear on if we get selected for the consistency and findings. So again, it, it's a California specific curriculum, but the workshop proposal is how you can develop, you take our framework and develop something similar for consistency and findings within your program, as well as a transfer of learning. One is a um, workshop where we're going to hopefully walk somebody through how to use transfer of learning. So if you are sending staff to that conference, just be on the lookout if those get accepted, that those might be really great workshops for folks to attend so that they can learn how to do some of this stuff themselves and have that sustainability within your own program. All right, so that's it for the website, unless Kat or Krista, you had anything else to add? Yeah, I just will add that the supervisor training tab is very much under construction, and so um, eventually this supervisor core um, will look very different, and it will lay out the new competency areas and all the training modules underneath. These, what is up here right now, are the um, the, the instructor-led uh, curricula from about 2011-2012. Still perfectly fine to use, but um, so this is not reflective of what I was talking about yet. But more to come, and we'll let everybody know as that um, as that moves forward. So that's all I wanted to to add to that. Great. And Kat, did you have anything else to add? No, Emily. Thank you. Okay. All right. So as Kristen navigates back to our slides, um, for those that are able to access the PDF version of the slides, that's located. Nope, I think we may have lost Emily. Did we lose Emily? Okay, well, I will take over um, since I, I created this slide. So we, we also wanted to just make sure that um, you know about some really good resources that are out there that really enforce some of the um, some of the uh, what we have talked about today. So obviously there is the link um, to the Academy's website, uh, APS Workforce Innovations. I also want to point out for some of you who are uh, going um, new into vir the virtual world or e-learning, you know, synchronous, asynchronous, all the different platforms. Um, the NAPSA Education Committee last July did a really good, um, we pulled our, our all of our committee members together from different states and we did a um, from in-person to virtual deliveries, successes, challenges, and considerations, which is still a really, really great resource. So if you go to the NAPSA a webinar webpage and scroll down, you'll see the recording. Um, there's a, a couple really good handouts. Um, so I, I would encourage you to look at that. And then of course, our very own APS TARC uh, did a great education and training toolkit that um, that actually Kat worked on a lot and I contributed to a bit and um, NAPSA and everybody came together. Um, so hopefully that'll be a good resource for you as well. Anything else, Kat, do you want to add? Nope. Nope, thank you. All right. Well, Andy, any other questions before we let folks have um, have their time back? Well, just one, really. But this is a reminder where if you do have questions, go ahead and type them in the questions box, and I'll get to them in a moment. And and this is more uh, theoretical, or or your opinion, and this could go for either of you. Why do you think there's a lack of supervisor training? What do you attribute that to? Is it an obvious answer that it's a smaller workforce than workers, or is there more to it than that? Um, well, this is this is based on my opinion and also just the, the research as well. Yes, I do think it's a bit of a smaller workforce, but I think historically APS programs have been underfunded and training has been even more underfunded. And so therefore we have prioritized um, uh, frontline workers um, as the the ones to really make sure that we get trained up. Um, and supervisors, um, because of um, 
their role in being super busy and we have we've kind of left left them behind um, so I it's not intentional it's just it's just the way that everything has been funded but the good news is uh, number one training is on everybody's radar training for APS folks is on everybody's radar it's not just the weird training nerds anymore that are excited about this and and that's awesome number two is in the last couple years um, a, a People have come together and realized that supervisors need that support, that need that training. So ACL has um, some language and recommendations around it. The TARC has definitely um, put out some resources and tools around that. And then certainly those of us who have been working in California and then also on the national level, um, we wanted to do this back back after we got a handle on um, on worker core and now is the time now there's the bandwidth and there is the funding um, and so that is so that's my take on it I, I invite anybody else to share their opinion um, as well um, but well I will say as an a as a former APS supervisor for several years I think you're spot on with that so that's my I also think it has to there's a piece about the ongoingness of training. So folks all can agree that people need to be taught skills up front and know how to do your job. And then you go in the field and then you get skilled by experience. And I think that lends itself to supervisors too, is that most supervisors come from some type of line work. They may not be all APS, but some were APS investigators. So they have the initial training sure. and they have the experience. And that's true for supervisors and it's true for line staff and administrators and managers as well is we forget about the need for ongoing training. So yeah, whether that's right. enhanced or enrichment, um, I think supervisors fall in that category is, well, you were trained earlier and you have all this experience. We'll give you some handbooks and, and meetings and that'll be lives. what we can do. <laughs> Yeah, right. we'll train you. We'll train you up on the H HR and the liability issues, and then not anything Turning about down. like, you know, not not anything about like, you know, from buddy to boss or any of the other, you know, case consultation, anything beyond, you know, beyond sometimes. So, um, yeah, but I I feel I'm probably the most hopeful I've ever I've ever felt in my whole entire career in aging adult services has been this year, even though it's been the ru a really rough year. I do feel so hopeful for the national spotlight. And then we are pretty hopeful here in California as well that um, that our, our work, um, all of your work um, is is going to be better supported. So. And I think maybe ending on that very hopeful note is, um, <laughs> is a perfect thing to do. Um, I agree with that very hopeful note. So um, I just want to say, and Chris, if you go to the very last slide for me, uh, there should be a, some APS TARC contact information sure. somewhere. Hold on there. one minute. I lost yeah. my little. Take your time. Um, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you so much to our presenters today. And Emily, I know we lost you for a second, but it, that was totally fine. That is the nature of the internet, I think. Um, so we're glad to, that you came back for the tail end of things. Here is the contact information for the APS TARC. Um, you have our web address and our email address. If you want to reach out to us, you can get to us through the website as well. Thank you so much, Catherine Preston Wager and Krista Brown and Emily Sulpizio. Really appreciate all the information you provided today. Some great resources, many of them 100% free. So keep that in mind. And um, thanks to all of our attendees for joining us today so much. We hope everybody has a fantastic weekend. Take care, everybody. Right. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.